black like me. Black, 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 black like me. You're listening to Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G, a podcast that invites you to experience the world through the perspective of one black man, one conversation, one story, or even one rant at a time. Here's Dr. G. Hey, 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 good people. Welcome back to another exciting episode of Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G. Now, I keep telling you week after week after week, don't I? Like every week I tell you, we're bringing these exciting conversations with folks about the subjects of race and justice and and how we do better. You know, this isn't a race baiting podcast. We're not just trying to call out issues for the sake of calling them out, but we really are solutions focused. But sometimes we have to have the talk. We have to have the conversation in order to know what we're really dealing with. Now, As a middle-aged professional black man, I am constantly asked, ad nauseum in fact, to speak on behalf of black thought, black people, black criminals, black elite, black politicians, black authors, you name it if it's black, I'm asked to come on TV, radio, podcasts, and to explain black people to white people. Well, today I'm gonna have white people explain (laughs) white people to me and our listeners. And so I'm having a good conversation with two sharp young men, and you're going to enjoy this this conversation um, quite a bit. I've got Tyler Nyland on, who is uh, part of my staff. He actually was one of the founding team members of this podcast. And so if you've been around for a while, you remember his name. He's a pastor. He's a theologian. um, He's a networker extraordinaire. He can make some good coffee. He's a former barista, jack of all trades, and has really been a partner with me in crime for the last several years. Uh, He's flanked by his friend, Joel, who is a PhD student in philosophy at UW-Madison. And um, Joel, I heard that you just passed, is it your prelims or or, or, uh, the big test that you do before you start your dissertation? And so I heard that that you've done that. And so I'm, I'm very proud of you for that. They're both part of the faith community that I lead and they're both white males. Tyler and Joel, welcome to Black Like Me. Good to be here. Thanks for having me back. It feels good after I went out on top as the manager of the Wisconsin best podcast in the whole state. I felt like I had to retire after that one. And then you dumped us. Then you went <laughs> for, for wider pastures. I think it was at that point, Tyler, that you found out that you're working for someone black and you wanted to change things up. And um, wow. So uh, no, but we appreciate no, what no. you've done, though, Tyler. We appreciate what you've done. But wow, that one, that one hurts. That one it's hurts. good to be back. It's good to yeah, be back. Tyler, it's good, it's good to have you back, young male. And um, Joel, listen, I, I, I've been doing some research on you, man. You know, your dissertation has got some hot topics, man, like benefiting from injustice. That, I won't say all of it because I don't want other PhD candidates out there to steal your stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Joel, I, at some point, I would love for you to come back. I haven't even heard you talk yet, <laughs> but I want you to come back <laughs> because the whole idea of explaining injustice and how it works and who it benefits it's such, it's, it's a real concept, but it's also so nebulous that it's hard for people to grasp. But so if, you know, I would love it if, if, if you would consider coming back just so we can expound on that topic. But guys, it's just, it's really good having you, having you mm-hmm. both here. Thank you. Now, Joel, you may not, you may not know this, but usually I open up with a black icebreaker. I don't always do that with my white guests, but because Tyler was actually note-taking as I created this concept of black icebreaker, you know, we used to meet like at 7 a.m. at Panera's. And so, uh, yeah, Tyler used to like fall over in the seat laughing. And so, Tyler, I got a couple of um, black icebreakers for you. And these are not the ones that you took notes on, hopefully. Ooh, but I th- <laughs> knew it. <laughs> oh, my. Let me see. No, Tyler, I was going to give you an easy one. I was going to say like, all right, Tyler, grits or cream of wheat? Grits or cream of wheat? I love I got that one. I love grits, that one. <laughs> and I'm 100% a grits with, uh, with, with salt and cheese and shrimp. I want and, bougie. Oh, you're gonna go in like that. You're gonna go in bougie. I want bougie grits. So you eat black and that wait, are you appropriating grits? That's a great question. Am I are you offended? Yes, because you don't put you don't put sugar in them. Oh, yeah, Joel, grits or cream of wheat. So absolutely grits. And um I grew up eating grits with not not often, 
but um, here and there. And it was always with two eggs on top, two fried eggs on top and some See, butter. That's what I'm talking about, Joel. Yeah. Yeah, break some bacon up in it. That's just that's just taking to a whole nother glory. You, I mean, you're at Big Mama's house when you break some bacon up on that. Yeah. No, I, I will <laughs> say if I have a preference, though, I'm going to go with oatmeal. I'm going to go with overnight oats. <laughs> yeah, overnight. <laughs> that's overnight so true. Oats. That's fair. That's my I eat that probably five days a week. Give me some oat milk, some blueberries, some slivered almonds. Oh, man. OK, no, that's good. That's good. Um, Tyler, <laughs> do, you, do you use a washcloth? I use... I'll be honest, I use a loofah. <laughs> this I is use a loofah. I joke, Joel. No, no, because we're <laughs> laughing at this because Tyler and I know when we talk to black guys, they're like, yeah, when we started showering like in middle school, like we took washcloths to shower because our moms and our dad said, no, you, you don't share that soap. You soap your towel up and you <laughs> use a washcloth. We call them butt rags. Like you don't just pass a bar of soap around. And so some of the white guys are like, what's What's a washcloth? What's a washcloth? Do you wash your legs, Tyler? I do wash my legs. It <laughs> is a newer thing. It's a newer phenomenon. I was going to ask you, did it just start because of the podcast? Well, here's the Swift? thing. Yeah, yeah, it kind of did because, well, I just never thought about it before. Um, you got <laughs> I gotta to be them, honest. They but this is to the ground. I always talk about how being part of a black community helps healing and helps re relieving toxicity. And I yes. think that might be one of the ways that that's really uh... by loofer loofering. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Loofer the legs. Oh my goodness, Tyler. The other you know, it's because you because you listen to me write them down and ask people. So I'm not going to even ask you anymore. But Joel, I'm going to come to you. This is not necessarily a black icebreaker, but I always like to get the take uh, my white friends take on this. What does freaking a mean? Yeah. Okay, so let me let me preface by saying I was very excited for Black Icebreakers because as I've been listening to your podcast, like you start every podcast off this way. I think it's amazing. It's so wonderful. Um, so you. yeah, I, I listened to your most recent podcast uh, episode where you talked about this question, and um, I think I think freaking A has like a modest use and a more intense use, and the more intense use is like it just it reveals like real intense anger, like it's just real intense frustration. But I think it's kind of become more common to just use it as a way of even expressing like mild frustration. So, you know, Tyler doesn't have any, we don't have any bro pictures together. So I might say to Tyler, freaking A, man, like, what's up with that? <laughs> and so yeah. it's more in jest. But yeah, freaking A has, I think, become this all encompassing way of saying, what the heck? What's going on here? Gotcha. Now, did you, did you ever use the phrase growing up or was it, did you ever hear it in your home? Well, certainly not by my parents, but um. <laughs> so wait, is this a swear? Like, so, so freaking A. So, is it, it, growing up, was this considered swearing? I think was so. It, it depends on the community you come from, right? Sure. Like, so I've 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 been in, in like very conservative, uh, very conservative religious communities, and then some that are not as much. Right. And I think to, for some of the parents, like in high school, when they heard when they heard us saying this, they were like, you know, deeply concerned, and they're like, "What's going on with?" with like youth culture, what are they saying? But, but I don't know, in other places, it was just so common. And like, I think our parents would like roll our eyes when we said freaking A, but they just kind of put up with it. Sure, sure. I love asking that question. And I love that it's slightly <laughs> different each time. I asked a couple of um, black guys this, I don't know if you heard this episode yet yes. with um, Ephraim and, and Adam. And so, so, so I said, Ephraim, what, <laughs> what does freaking A mean? He says, it means that all the black people should leave the building. <laughs> it, took me like, it took me like a minute to re, to compose myself after that because that was that was so funny. Because uh, yeah, I feel like when someone white says freaking A, if you don't know them, you should probably duck. It's almost like when someone black says, oh, hell no. Because you know, something's gonna get thrown or said or did. like that's not just displeasure. It usually is solidified with some action. And so, oh man, I love it. Okay, so just, just uh, so tell, I got a white icebreaker, just a icebreaker. Ooh. Just icebreaker. Why do some white people rub each other's backs while sharing and singing out of hymnals at church? <laughs> yeah. Are you are you referring to uh, couples and? I don't know who they are because when I come into <laughs> a church, I don't know who's Zoom and who. But I just will see. <laughs> I've just been in church trying to get my religion on, and I've seen like a guy with his hand. I assume it's his wife with his hand in her back pocket. We hope so. And then like she's rubbing his back and they're sharing a hymnal. I, I just grew up in black church where we we're too busy shouting it out. Like we were just yeah. jumping them aisles, jump, pews and running those aisles and praising the Lord. I, 
I never thought about pausing and putting my hand in my wife's back pocket or rubbing her back. Help me out. I don't know. It is weird. I will say, like, Joel, have you seen it? Do your... you know what I'm talking about? Oh, I, I've seen it. I've, I've totally seen it. I see it, all, you know, see it all the time. And, <laughs> and, and, and Joel, I don't know if this is an experience for you, but like when you were in high school, wasn't like the big part of like church when you sit next to your girlfriend or something or and you just like hold hands? Like it was almost like the movie theater, except it's at church instead. Except you God is there. Make, yeah, except that you're trying to make a move and hold hands. Joel, was that an experience for you or not? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that I experienced it myself, but I saw it. Yeah. And I think, I mean, think about some of the worship songs we sing. Um, you know, it, it, I'm thinking about some of the like really flowery, almost like quasi romantic worship I could, songs. I could sing of your love forever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, tons of like some of these songs. And I just wonder if that like creates a certain kind of like mood, or, like a kind of like rom- quasi romantic mood. But I definitely know what you're referring to. That's um, funny. I mean, the worst, the worst case scenario is like, I, I remember when I was doing youth ministry for a while, I remember that one of our worship leaders who was a student was dating this girl and we were singing a song. I think the lyrics were something like, you're all I want, you're all I need, but it's supposed right. to be like in reference to God. And like, of you course. could just tell they were having this really intimate <laughs> connection. They were just like looking at each other. And as a youth leader, I'm like, no, this is not, this is not the point, <laughs> it's not happening. but there it is unfolding in front of me. It was very, very awkward. <laughs> I could sing of your love forever. I mean, you, Jesus, I could sing. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. It's like, hmm, someone probably needs to talk to them about accountability. Okay, now, <laughs> Tyler, last thing. Can you tell if a person is black by their name? Can you tell if a person is black by their name? <laughs> You've been working around black culture. Not always, Tyler, have- but are there some times you look at a name, you're like, that's black. I'll be honest if I didn't say that I have suspicions. <laughs> you have suspicions. <laughs> I have I have I have a, I have an assumption. Uh, what because there are apostrophes and dashes? What are you saying? I don't know exactly. You know, maybe <laughs> maybe. maybe. <laughs> I, I, All right, I, we better stop. We better <laughs> stop right there. It's getting kind of hot up here in the black black lady podcast studios. No, gentlemen, I'm so glad you're that that you're here. And um I want to talk with you about a number of things because for a number of reasons. One is, Joel, I'm just getting to, to know you, but I certainly have appreciated you and could tell that you're following me and some of the things that I'm doing on, on social media. Of course, I've known Tyler since he was, since he was a grad, grad student. And I think it's important for people to realize that people from different ethnic backgrounds can build trusted relationships. It doesn't mean that we've not bumped heads on things, but there's a level of trust that allows us to come back to really feeling like we're part of family and that we want to we want to do good together. So I want people to to hear us be able to laugh and talk about um, some of the racial some of the racial uh, idiosyncrasies syncrasies, but also to talk about what the real issues are. So I'm hoping today that I can prompt or provoke the two of you to you as white men to spill a little tea, um, as as the term is. I should have used it as an icebreaker. Spill a little tea uh, on white supremacy and white supremacy culture. And I don't want you to do it in a way. Um, that makes it feel like you're demeaning, like somehow you're getting off by demeaning um, folks from your from your ethnic groups. But I just want honest input. And I'm typically trying to discuss this or process this alone or with other black people. But getting a chance to do this from a practitioner's perspective, a theologian's perspective, a philosopher's perspective, I think is really, really important. And so I'll just start off by just asking some questions um, that will hit and um, so the first one is, um, if asked to describe yourselves ethnic- ethnically or culturally without using American or white, how, how do you talk about yourselves if you, if you were to, you know, sort of address y- yourself culturally? Yeah, I would say um, for me, I, I, even a few years ago, back when we met uh, back in grad school, I would say I wouldn't have even known what that meant or you're like, what are you I'd saying? Been, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd have been like, what do you mean? I'm just, I'm just white. That's just, or I'm uh, just American. I'm just American. Or I, sure. Um, I remember being in a classroom <clears throat> once in that, that coming up and me going to the idea of like, I don't know, I, it just, I just kind of feel normal, um, which is such a telling thing, right? For that to be, <laughs> wow, that to be what, my what you just is, said. Yeah. It, I mean, that's, that's really what so I'm felt. abnormal. So I'm abnormal. Tyler? Well, uh, I think I had to process some of that stuff. Sure. Of, no, no, you're being honest. Mean, no, right? exactly, exactly. Like, and uh, 
I'm baseline. That's what you're saying. I'm baseline. Yeah. Yeah. And I just felt like, well, I don't have a culture or I, I, I'm just white. I don't know. Uh, sure, so sure. it's interesting as, as we've done more work, I come to really, really identify or try and identify back with my ethnic identity of being Polish and Irish and trying to re- reflect on what has been robbed of me or what's been taken of me by whiteness and not sure, seeing sure. whiteness as, um, and seeing that whiteness actually affects me as well. And, and robs me of my own ethnic identity and perspective. And so, so trying to go back and, and reclaim some of that, but it feels, sometimes it feels very weird because I go to Polish celebrations or Irish celebrations. I got no idea what's going on. There. Sure. Uh, sure. It just feels out of place, but that, that's sort of what I would say. No, that's really, that's, that's good. Joel, how about you? Yeah, I think that I, it's interesting because I think if you had asked that question of like six-year-old or seven-year-old Joel, you'd get a very different answer than asking that question of me now. Mm-hmm. And uh, the reason is that my, so my dad is Hispanic. He's from Bolivia. Okay. And my mom was raised in America and she has like, you know, English uh, and Irish background. And, and so we actually lived for a time in South America and that was very special. That was very special to me. Mm -hmm. as a child like I remember when we moved back to the United States when I was like I was like seven um it was something that was a kind of like a treasure something that I I cherish that I I I could speak some Spanish um I knew a little bit about some some aspects of Hispanic culture and people would ask me like oh where, where did you come from like my you know friends at school and so on but honestly like I I I grew up thereafter in Michigan in a very very white community uh very very uh yeah, uniform in terms of its ethnic backgrounds, its racial background. And I just honestly think that a lot of that sort of um, pride and like treasure in my, my, my Bolivian heritage just kind of got, you know, metaphorically and literally whitewashed. Um, and I think that it wasn't until I started listening to some of your work and attending FOL that it really hit me how much I had completely neglected that history. Wow. And like Tyler saying, like, like I didn't have a, I just didn't have a conception of myself as someone who had this like rich ethnic heritage. I was just, I was just American. I was just white. Right. And um, so I think I lost touch with that. Uh, that's, that's a very powerful answer and response. Um, Tyler, you know, you've been around since we um, really started growing our, our U S black history program. And so I'm just curious, you know, You've known you. You learned a little bit, or probably um, more than your your peers, um, about U.S. Black history and the things that have been, uh, bl- you know, just you know, just left out. But I'm curious, how do you how do you now, as as a more um, aware person, and having sat in on two or three of these sessions of U.S. Black history, like nine weeks of U.S. Black history, how do you feel about your miseducation surrounding U.S. Black history? Yeah, I mean, I think. Uh, in one sense, it's where I, I think, or I think I can identify with justified anger um, because there's an anger piece to it that kind of comes up. It's, it's, we see this all the time in our, our, our people who uh, take the, go through the courses. There's just this shock. There's this grief. There's this lament. Um, and I think lament is where that anger uh, really turns into uh, mm-hmm. just, just being just, just grieving the fact of, wow, I did not know this. I wasn't aware of this. My, my, um, my schooling wasn't aware of this. My, my, my family background wasn't aware of this. Uh, all of these historic details that were so true. And so making, um, making our country what it is and, and resulting in the disparities and the the realities that we see going on in our, not only our city, but our whole nation, uh, it just results in, uh, anger that that really results in grief and lament that feels like a continual process of going deeper and deeper i mean each time we take the history course each time i go through it as even a staff just participating i learn something new every time like learning about this past time about the insurance agencies being formed as a result of slave ships and being Mm -hmm. the the insurance happening to 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 protect the quote-unquote financial assets that they were carrying on ships and 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 Doing that that just blows my mind and, and it makes me think oh my gosh like insurance i i never thought about where insurance comes before right um and so right. things like that they just continue it's like continual levels of grief and anger that that, that pop up as a result right so so guys 
so we know that this history is real and, and we don't reflect back on it in order to be stuck, but so that we can move together ahead. So what happens in your head and hearts when you hear about a movement to, um, to not talk about that history? I mean, there's pressure on, on campuses. I think UW-Madison might have faced pushback on this. If you offer classes about white supremacy or white dominance, you know, there was during the Trump administration, there was talk about um, um, withholding funds from institutions um, if they teach about um, U.S. history or slavery. And so because this is our joint history and it tells a fuller picture of the United States, what's the reaction in, in each of your hearts when you think, when you see obvious steps being taken to whitewash, no pun intended, whitewash history? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's, um, it's concerning. It's unfortunate. And I, and I often wonder where is this coming from? You know, and I think just to, just to go back even a little bit to your question to Tyler, I think one of the things I wasn't, I wasn't put, I wasn't like positioned to see Mm -hmm. with my own experience concerning black history was the enduring legacy, the enduring legacy of slavery, the enduring legacy of Jim Crow, right? So we, right. we live in a time right. where it's very, very common and it has been for a long time to think that we live in a post-racial society, that the civil rights movement basically took care of the most pernicious and ubiquitous forms of racism in the United States, right? So I, I routinely run into people, whether it's students or people I'm talking with on social media or elsewhere, who are very puzzled by the current outcry against racial mm-hmm. injustice. Because in their minds, like, there's nothing, there's nothing to uh, raise an alarm about. Like, the United States is not systemically racist. Uh, we haven't been since the 60s, right? Right. And I just think that it, I just think that if you take even a slight dive into that history, you can trace a lot of current racial adversities back to things that happened during the Jim Crow era and have continued to impact uh, you know, people of color. And right. I, 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 I just think there's this kind of like gap where we need, we need to see that trajectory. We need to see the connection. I mean, I was recently talking to someone about systemic racism. Like I, I, I sort of have this, um, I don't know if you want to call it like a calling, but I really love to talk to white people about systemic racism and try to try to just take them on a journey, like of just looking through some of the evidence, like let's just roll up our sleeves and let's just like, look at some of this evidence. And one thing that I often hear is that um, that's fine. Like, look, we can look at that evidence, but why are you appealing to things that happened in the past? Like that is the past. Let's focus on the present. And I think this just reveals a, a very deep misunderstanding about the way that history works and about the way that right. past right. racial discrimination creates massive ripples effects into the fu- ripples into the future. And so when I hear about, you know, this resistance to learning about this history, I, I think we are not helping ourselves. We are not helping ourselves answer this question. Is there something worth being concerned about today? If you want to know whether there's something worth being concerned about today, yes, there's plenty of evidence about disparities and and inequitable policies that have recently been implemented. Let's have that conversation. But you also have to understand the ongoing impact and legacy of things that happened decades ago. So like history isn't just history, like it's, it's making a difference on current issues. So so right. I think I think it's concerning when people want to kind of bury this part of our past. Uh, it's very unfortunate. Sure, sure, and that's an extreme and and um, a very overt approach, like to defund organizations that want to talk about it. Yeah, but, but Joel, I'm I'm curious about something you said a little earlier. You moved to the United to the United States from South America. Did someone say downplay your your South American culture? Um, so I'm, I'm just interested because, you know, Bolivia has a very rich, beautiful, colorful history, certainly lots of African influence um, in South America. So I'm just curious, as we're talking about the, you know, the influence of white dominance, what causes a seven-year-old kid to think that it's not important to own that part of you, like half of you, um, but that it's more um, beneficial to lean in um to, to whiteness. Cause you know, I mean, so anyway, I'm, I'm curious about that. Yeah. I think it's an interesting issue. I, I don't know that there's anything overt that led to that. I think it, it's very subtle social pressures, sure. right? In some ways it's just, it's this subtle, implicit narrative that 
uh, America is one thing. Mm-hmm. And by one thing, I mean one race sure. and one sure. background. And as you start to integrate into that, um, you just absorb it. Like you just absorb it. I mean, I'm not a sociologist, but I, I think there's a, there's a, there's a kind of like absorb absorbing of this narrative. And, right. a, a, and as a result, a shedding of other things that like might have been valuable and meaningful to you. And so, I don't know. I was never encouraged to appreciate that history. I was never encouraged to, to think about it. it it's not that there wasn't messages of diversity. This is really important because I think people mm-hmm. listening, you know, people who are maybe like, unsure about what's going on right now as far as racial justice might say that's unfair because like you know we all watch the the schoolhouse rock videos in high school at least my generation i'm a a millennial so we watch these schoolhouse rock videos and you know america's a melting pot like of course we affirm this difference yeah but it was really thin it was very thin and the the melting pot even the metaphor of a melting pot means like now there's this oneness there's this cohesion and so Looked, Which means think, we called it what it was. I mean, when people said yeah. melting pot, we thought, oh, the uniqueness of flavors and vegetables and different ores and minerals coming into this. But America was very clear. Melting pot, the end result, one thing. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Joel, but no, I think that's it. it's important to understand that America has not always hidden its intentions. And I love America. I just like to challenge the things, the fringes around the edge that aren't that healthy, but you're right. It's, it's pushing for one thing. And so if you, if you hold to your uniqueness too much, somehow you feel like then you're not a part of the melting pot and you're trying to stand out and being, um, I don't know, isolated or, or an individual, you should just become this American or yeah. whatever it is and stop talking about your unique contributions. And I think even um, just piggybacking on what Joel's saying about the youth element and the younger person dynamic and it mm-hmm. being more of an implicit and less of an explicit thing. Um, it reminds me of a story that I had from last summer um, where after everything happened with George Floyd, uh, there was a, uh, a woman who called me, um, a friend of mine for a long time. And she, she's back from my hometown and she ended up calling me and she wanted to talk about racism. And I was like, okay, well, yeah, let's talk about it. And so she called me and she actually told me a story. Um, the reason the story she told me was that she, after everything happened with George Floyd, she said, I need to talk to my child. I need to talk to my children about this. I need to sit them down and talk to them, which is wonderful, right? That's what we, we talk about all the time, which is we have to talk to our white kids about this because our, our white kids are going to grow up to be those in Charlottesville. Our white kids are going to be the ones who grow up if we don't challenge and correct them and, 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 and work and with them at them. that age and actively, like you said, promote at age seven saying you don't have to throw away your, uh, as in Joel's sense, you don't, you don't have to kind of not even disregard. We want to continue to affirm and identify that Hispanic heritage. Right. Um, and so he was, she was talking to her son and after George Floyd sent, sat down and gave like a talk about racism, talked about the history of racism in the U S sat down and talked with her 10 year old son, white kid, and gave a whole piece. At the end of it, her 10-year-old son looked at her and in a household that was never explicitly racist by any means, never never any of that sort of stuff, would never say anything negative uh, explicitly like that. Her son looked at her and said, but mom, black people are just criminals. And he, she, she looked at him and she said, what wow. do you talk? Why would you, why would you ever say that? I would, you've not learned that in this household. We've never... And he just looked at her and said, but mom, that's just all they are on TV. And she was like, just terrified. And she was just like, but, but what about your coach? And what about your, the, the, the one friend you have at school who, and he said, well, they're my friend. They're, they're the okay ones, but like everyone else is just a criminal, aren't they? And it was that curious, right. inquisitive, like that, that just, this was just a formation in ten a years household, old. Ten, 10 years, years old. old in a household that has no, uh, that that is not explicitly trying to be racist sure, right sure. like it's 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 trying to embrace diversity in a sense right but when we don't have those active things that that push in immediately and 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 this is why i think it's so important for us to have programs in specifically white places uh whether it's white churches white schools whatever wherever it is that directly confront and address this early because without that we have the tendency to let those children who embrace that narrative from a young age, grow up to become the Derek Chauvin's, to grow up to become the men in Charlottesville because they've been sitting in our pews, they've been sitting in our streets and um, they've embraced that narrative from an early age. And it, 
they, they have a hard time shedding it. From sure. That. And then when it's us and them, it's easy to say, well, what was said to say that 10 year old's grandfather, they are taking your jobs. Mm -hmm. And then what they might've said to his father in his father's generation, they are taking our women. They are moving next door. They are kneeling at football games. They are ruining America because you, because he's already formed this and because it's not being refuted or challenged in church, in school, at home. And people are just assuming that folks are just neutral. You know, just like you said, no, I'm, well, I'm just baseline. The assumption is that young white kids are just a clean slate. And wherever they're getting those images, let's just say if they're media, the flip side is sending images to black kids. We can't be doctors, we can't be astronauts, we can't be whatever, because people who could put those images in front of us are choosing not to do the work to do that. Or we're just trying to be social workers and babysitters at school. We don't wanna fill your head with, with the nonsense of you could really grow up out of this community and become something and, and do something. So the flip side is that black kids are coming home not seeing black teachers or administrators thinking we get arrested, we get shot, we get beat, um, we get beaten. And it's just, we have to talk about it. We have to have shows like this and relationships like this. Yeah, Joel. Yeah, and I think I think there's a real tension in like the American mind, the white American mind. Mm -hmm. um, we pride ourselves in being a nation that has like, you know, that, that, that allowed in some way for diversity a very selective kind of allowing, but on this, uh, at the same time, uh, it's very, very common for people to say something like this, especially since last summer, they'll say something like race was never on my mind. I never thought about race. I never saw color yes, until yes. you guys, you, you race, you, you, um, justice activists, you started talking about it. You brought it to our consciousness and that's creating the problem. And then, you know, there are studies, some studies showing that uh, for a lot of white people, one of the sources of racial tension in the United States is the fact that we've been having these conversations, right? It's the conversation that's creating the tension. It couldn't be systemic racism. No, because people tend to doubt that there is systemic racism. So they have to reach for some, so, some other explanation. It's CRT, it's Marxism. It's the fact that we're just having this conversation. And so there's a, there's a real tension here. There's a real dissonance. We care about diversity, but we don't wanna talk about the things that concern diversity. And so- right. Um, right. I, I just, the number of times since last summer that I've, I've talked with people who have said, I never thought about race, never thought about color until you started talking about it, until the media started talking about it, until BLM started talking about it. And, and it just reveals that our conception of what it means to be diverse is very, very shallow. And we just kind of yes. think like, if you just kind of go along with things, then diversity will flourish and it won't flourish because it's um, the people who have the most social power and the most political representation and so on are the ones who are going to, they're going to dominate the, the cultural narrative. They're going to become the norm. So yeah, you, we have to have these conversations. Sure. And when, you, you know, it's interesting, Joel, you mentioned that there are those out there who, who are white, who say, I never thought about this until you brought it up. Yeah. When, when, when you say that, what comes to mind is just sort of um, a generic neighbor or someone in a grocery line at a grocery store, maybe, um, you know, just, just, we don't think of that, that, that individual that's saying or feeling that could be a, is likely a principal of a school, a police officer, a judge, a doctor, so that these are people living in caves or in vacuums that are thinking and feeling these things. That's why back like during the height of the KKK, they wore robes and cover and hoods because they didn't want you to see that they were the judges and the doctors and even the preachers and the deacons and the bankers. But what's very, what we have to understand is that the people who think that folks like uh, like my like you know like myself and others that we are the race baiters that we would all be just American if you didn't have to become Afro American or African and American. We're not understanding that these people, most you know, very likely are, are, are in powerful positions where they're able to act out on that um, optional ignorance, and that has an impact on hiring and diversity and upward mobility and all of those things. And so yes. we just need to call that to people's attention that the ideal is to not ignore these things because it's not helping anyone but white dominance. Yeah, and I mean, to add to that, I think whether you're consciously thinking about race or ethnicity or diversity, 
it's coming up in your life, right? Of course. So uh, I- implicit and unconscious mechanisms are, I mean, they're prevalent in our thinking. And I, and I think that, you know, to help ourselves as far as racial justice education goes, we also need to do good science education. And I think mm-hmm. people need to be made aware of the way that implicit bias impacts our thinking. Because uh, again, I just run into so many people, students included, who think, look, I don't make judgments based on race. And well, the science suggests otherwise. And so I think part of disabusing people of these misconceptions about themselves and about their culture is just giving them, feeding them like scientific evidence. Like the evidence does not support what you're saying um, and just inviting them to like consider that. So that's a good, that's a very good point. You know, a little bit ago, you, you referred to a concept of CRT, um, critical um, race theory. I'm just wondering in your opinion, could each of you just help just to define that? And then to also help us to understand, help me to understand why so many faith leaders um, are preoccupied with this concept, CRT and Marxism. So if you could just help me just unpack that for the listeners and why is it tied to Marxism? Tyler, go you, ahead. You, you can go ahead, to... Joel. I'll, I'll jump in after. Yeah, it's, oh man. <laughs> it's we've such been, a, we've I, been having these talks within each other a lot too. Ooh. So we're, I think we're both just like, Oh man, which one wants to jump first? I'm I'm enjoying hearing your perspectives. It's just okay. So this is such an important issue, and let me let me just preface by saying something. Um, I I don't I don't necessarily do research within uh, critical race theory or critical theory at large. Um, Although I interact with people who do work in that in that area, so I just want to say this: I'm like no apologist for critical race theory. I I sometimes think that our discussions about critical race theory, at least the way that white people are bringing these up, uh, I think it's a distraction from the the most important issues. Mm -hmm. But I don't want white people to fixate and prioritize something they shouldn't be prioritizing, namely their fear of critical race theory. And for a lot of white people, especially conservatives, if the shadow of Marx is cast anywhere, they're immediately alarmed and they're consumed with, with, you know, with uh, interest and concern over that issue. So I've, I've had to think a lot about uh, the way that people are responding to CRT, not because I even do research on it, but because I, I, I want people to not fixate so much on that, but right. instead to, to take that journey towards allyship. So, so, so having said that, roughly critical race theory is a research program and a school of thought. It's a research program and a school of thought that has a set of goals and a set of research theses that it orients itself around. Its goal roughly is to explore the way that race impacts society at the level of politics, law, education, and so on, okay? Right. So that's its goal. Where is racism in society? And it's, it's a critical project which means that it's corrective. It wants to undo. It's not just saying here it is. And it's not just sociology, right? Like it's attempting to undo. That's what makes it critical. Now you might think, well, that seems really uncontroversial. Like why would anyone be concerned about that? (laughs) Well, that's fair enough. But where the controversy comes is with the thesis. So, So the goal is to address racism and to explore where racism comes up. But because it's a research program in School of Thought, it tends to do its research uh, in light of or guided by a set of theses. So roughly one, one pillar of critical race theory is that racism is ubiquitous. Racism is the norm. It's not, it's not abnormal. Like racism, systemic racism is real. The other pillar is intersectionality. Uh, another pillar is that society tends to divide between those who have power and those who have, who don't. And this can actually be broken up into two like sub theses. One is, you know, w- one view of, of you know, oppressive societies is that the system does the oppressing and then people are broken up into oppressed and privileged. But on another view, it's true that the system does the oppressing, but there's also this robust group of oppressors and oppressed. Mm-hmm. And so there's different ways of thinking about oppression, but roughly you know, CRT says that there, there are these two groups, whether the privileged or the oppressors, and then on the other hand, the oppressed. And finally, um, you know, CRT emphasizes positionality. So your position, your socioeconomic, racial, ethnic position, your gender is going to impact the way you see and experience racism. It's going to inform whether you have the capacity to speak authoritatively to racism uh, about it. So this is sometimes called standpoint epistemology, where your capacity as a testifier, 
your authority as a testifier hinges on your socioeconomic, racial, ethnic, gender mm -hmm. status. Right. And on some versions, there's like a strong version of standpoint epistemology and a weaker version. A strong version says like, if you're white and you live in a white supremacist society, like you can't say anything about this issue. Um, your, your positionality is so obscured, so insulated that you just can't speak at all to this. And we just need to, it's just people of color who can speak to the question of whether there's systemic racism and how to undo it. A more modest version says, you better listen up because your position has obscured your understanding of the nature and ubiquity of racism and how to undo it. So um, there's, there's more and, you know, like critical race theorists sometimes have views of, of racism that many people find questionable, like the P plus P equals R view, power plus privilege equals racism. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know. So that's, that's roughly critical race theory. Um, yeah. I don't know. Does that, any thoughts? Did I, did I, did I say anything incorrect I thought there? You, I thought you did a great job. Well, I think, time. yeah, I think that, you, that Jill did such a great job of summarizing sort of what it is. And I so agree with him on like the idea of we get caught up in this sort of theory and we use that and we label it. So that way we can, if it, I think a lot of the problem comes with some of the founders or some of the people who are constructing that view um, had some sort of ties to Marx or some sort of Marxist yeah. ideologies or something like that. And so if you can label the, the, the people who are, who are sort of creating this is that you can wipe away the whole system instead of it being, this was created. What is it? Was it in the seventies or the eighties? Yeah. Seventies. Cool. Yeah. So the seventies. So it was written in the seventies as a response to seeing the amount of racial discrimination that was happening sure. in the justice system. And so it was more of a theory that was in response to that. And now, so I don't know of anyone before the past two years, nobody who was talking about critical race theory as this is what I subscribe to as a black individual in this, in this community. This is as an anti-racist, this is what I ascribe to. It's this thing that like almost like white uh, institutions or, or places have labeled right. the fullness of what people of color have been saying and describing for the last 400 years. And they have, they've labeled it with this. And because they've labeled it with this one specific theory that also has Marxist ideologies at the, at the head, because they want to dismiss that, they just dismiss the whole thing. And now all yeah. of racism and anti-racism yeah. discussions are off to the side. They're, they're, they can't be discussed in this way. And so it, it's this huge distraction. It's this huge way of just equivalizing. Smoke screen. Yeah, yeah, just like kind of kind of equating racism discussions with this. And then if you're like, well, I've never heard of that before. Well, that doesn't mean it's not something that you ascribe to. This is Jesse Mopan, originally from Port Townsend, Washington, currently living in Madison, Wisconsin. I listen to Black Like Me because racism and white supremacy are very powerful forces at work in our society today which I'll never understand through my own lived experience as a white person. I feel like it's important to support you so that you don't have to rely on corporate donors and you can stay true to your message. And I heard about you through word of mouth. Thanks and keep it up. Now in its fifth season, the award-winning Black Like Me podcast has a reach throughout the U.S. and over 100 countries around the world. This amazing team of people here in Madison, Wisconsin, are dedicated to changing the conversation surrounding race. When you sign up to support Black Like Me as a patron, you support the creation of better quality content and a better society. You help to plant the seeds for a different and better tomorrow. By going to patreon.com forward slash black like me and signing up at any of the levels offered, you are not only signing up to make a monthly donation, you are also joining a growing community of people interested in engaging the issue of race with a raw, unprecedented honesty. As a patron of the podcast, you will have access to exclusive content like extended interviews, bonus rants, and video chats with Dr. G. You will also have a chance to join the conversation that other patrons are already having with Dr. G about race in America. To become a patron of the show, go to patreon.com forward slash black like me or see the link in our show notes. And for as little as $2 a month, you can support these important conversations and the work that Dr. G is doing. Back in, well, back in the 60s, 50s and 60s, folks who were Black Americans who were activists, you know, the way I am or way more than I am, they were often referred to as communists. And so I'm, I'm watching this theme sort of repeat itself, that if we can become marginalized by being um, written off as anti-American, mm. 
then um, we can be neutered intellectually, socially, economically. And typically you're put into a category where you're ostracized. And so you can't help your community or influence society. And so I, I don't want to cut off your next thought, Joel. I want you to answer that. But I really want to see, I want to hear from you two um, because people are accusing me and others like me, uh, particularly who are black and, and theologians and pastors. It's one of the things that, that we're hearing. Well, that's you're, you're just an adherent to CRT or you're just pushing CRT. And so I'm just, I'm, I'm curious if you can help me to understand, if you can help me spill some tea on, on, on American white supremacy, um, help me to understand what some faith leaders, white faith leaders are, are trying to tag me and others like me with when they say you're just pushing critical race theory. Is that just saying you're just a race baiter? You're not fully rooted in your Christian theology? And not that you're speaking for them individually, but you know people in those communities, you've lived among those communities. What's really being said and hurled on people like myself when we're, when we're accused of being CRT practitioners or theorists? I think um, a few things that I've, I've noticed in some ways is it kind of goes back to our discussion of diversity, mm -hmm. right? And then how we talked about, well, it, the goal is diversity. If the goal is diversity, um, then, well, I have a black staff member on my staff as a white pastor. So that means that we're doing what we need to do. Or as long as our goal is just to bring about the most amount of black people or Hispanic people or any people of color into our church, that's really the goal. But what happens when we do that is we do it with this white normative mindset still. Exactly. We still think that that's what our goal is. And, and so if you don't fit into that culture, then that's your issue, actually. You're the one who has the problem because we're here actually trying to create a diverse space. We hired you because we want you. Exactly. We hired you because you want you. And we don't actually want you. The thing is, we don't actually want you. If we no. were to want you, no, we would no. actually be bringing, uh, we'd be creating spaces that are safe enough for you to share your whole self, that you can you can bring your whole self to the table, that you can say those elements of, of feeling that racial disparity or saying, this doesn't feel right to me. And it wouldn't be seen as, well, what are you talking about? Why are you being so defensive? Why are you, why are you, why are you responding this way? It would be actually seen as embracing. Um, and so when I hear a lot about critical race theory, um, there's, there's this new, and this is within Christian circles, there's this new conference that's coming out called the, I think it's the woke conference. Yeah. And it's all of these white pastors that are coming together and that are uh, trying to come out against uh, the, the more critical race theory as they've labeled it type of, of stuff re related to social dynamics and racism. And they're saying that this is uh, racial dynamics in this sense and anti-racism work like this is the biggest threat to the gospel. Um, to mm -hmm. the good news of Jesus wow. that there possibly is. Now, number yeah. one, no, not true at all. But yeah. I will say that I do think the reason why they're so adamant against it is because I do believe that it is the biggest threat to their church. <laughs> not for I reasons think. they think. No, not for reasons they think. They think it's the biggest threat to their church because they think that it goes against the gospel message or the message of Christianity. I wholeheartedly disagree with that, but I do think that it's the biggest threat to their church because when, when young white individuals or individuals get awakened to this stuff, they can't help but have that element of grief, of, of lament. We've, I've talked with white pastors who have gotten very angry at us and the work that we do at Justified Anger because their white parishioners have left and been very angry mm. uh, with them and their, their leadership. Um, and it's because th this really is a threat to their church. Um, if we... Yeah, but I tell you, not not to, not just their church, their power structure, mm -hmm. their economic base is a threat to their to their way of living, and the very institution that has been anointed, dubbed, um, selected to free the captives, mm -hmm. is now enamored with the sound of clinking keys on their belts, and the opportunity to free people has been seen as a as as an inopportune thing. And so it's not just a threat to their church, but to the powerful position yeah. that their church and their doctrine. And, and then they blame us for it because we talk to their 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 um, people about it. And then what ends up happening is they end up not just leaving the church, but they end up leaving the faith. They end up leaving Christianity because they've never seen the compatibility of Christianity and anti-racism. And the result 
is that they blame us and say we're the ones who are de-Christianizing people. When in who's fact, us? Tyler, who's us and who's we? Well, just fight anger, the work of <laughs> Nehemiah, all of that. I thought uh, you were going to say us black people. Okay, I got no, you. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, Tyler, no, no, no. you know I'm messing with you. No, I love no. what you're saying. Keep going. So they're getting angry because they feel like, to Joel's point, this was never an issue until you hellraisers start talking about all of this stuff, which is why they call us race baiters. Exactly. And so we're the ones who are deconverting people. Um, because wow. of when we when we bring this stuff up, instead of it being an internal reflection piece going, we haven't brought this piece of compatibility to faith. Uh, and this truth, this truth coming out and people recognizing this truth is so jarring that they can't conceptualize that this would still fit in their narratives and their their structures that they've been a part of. And so they have to disassociate. And it breaks my heart. It it, it pisses me off. So. And Tyler, one of the reasons, and Joel, one of the reasons why we're discussing this is um, I want people to understand that issues of race and wokeness are not only being wrestled with or ignored in the academy and in the, in the corporate world, but also in within theological frameworks and faith institutions and Christianity itself. And so I just want listeners who might be turned off by certain expressions of faith because we're not talking about these issues. I want people to understand this, these issues are being discussed very deeply and there's a deep yes. wrestling with it. For example, I know there are many folks in the black community who don't touch the black church because we have not talked about issues of race. In their opinion, we have, been, we have become so acquiescent for, being, for just wanting white acceptance and white friendships and white neighbors and white teachers and schoolmates so badly that we've sold our souls up the river. Now that black churches are influencing non-black individuals to think critically about this, um, white people are starting to leave white churches. Um, and I don't think it's just because they want to hold the p positions of power. I, I mean, not just that, but they're leaving because what? This was reality and you've never talked about it. So we've been duped in history class my whole life. And now we've been duped in the pulpit and no one's talking about this. And now I have black friends. I've adopted black children. I've married into black families. And I didn't know that I have that I have been systemically, categorically blinded, misled, miseducated so that I could become a pawn in this machinery and a part of the proliferation of this crap. I'd want to get up and leave out of stuff, too, if I felt like, well, what's my value if everyone has used me in order to bring me into the camp of supremacy? And it's at that point that I think white individuals can begin to to wake up. And I'll just say this out. This is where people of color, faith leaders who are black like myself have got to understand there's going to be a huge shift of non-black people in these organizations who want to believe that justice and faith are not mutually exclusive. Yeah. Joel, do you want to say that, something? That, that's absolutely right. And I mean, I think we're, I think that there is. I mean, again, I don't have any data on this, but just when I when I think about the conversations I've had, the people I've interacted with who are in these predominantly white churches, predominantly white churches that are having very thin conversations about race, there's this growing, there's this growing frustration with that. There's this growing sense that we have to do better. And if those churches don't do better, I do suspect that that many, many white people are gonna leave. And my my hope is that they they they, their exodus takes them to a place where they can grow and lean into allyship and they can exactly. become part of, you know, communities like FOL um, and come under the authority and leadership of people like Dr. Chi and others uh, to, to go on that journey. But I, I think, you know, going back to this question of CRT and where, where this is coming from, it's, it's on the one hand, these accusations of like, oh, this is all Marxism. This is all critical race mm -hmm. theory. These, these might be legitimate worries, or they might actually just be post hoc rationalizations. It might, it might just be, a, um, it might just be coming from somewhere else. So, you know, I, I've been very surprised at how, how not novel these accusations are. So there's this really um, lovely book by Yasuhiro Katagiri. I hope I said that right. Black Freedom, White Resistance, and Red Menace, where he talks about uh, the civil rights movement and how uh, white people, especially in the Jim Crow South, were notorious and insistent in saying that uh, the civil rights movement was a Marxist plot. Okay, so this whole book is just incredibly gripping, incredibly frustrating. And sometimes when you read some of this, this history, you, 
you come away thinking these white people are disingenuous. They're not, they're, they're not really concerned about Marxism. They just want segregation to stay in place. Mm-hmm. So for example, I get this, I get this vibe when I, when I look at pictures. So in this book, there's a picture of some uh, pro segregationists at a, at a protest, at a rally, at some Capitol uh, building. And one of the signs says race mixing is communism. Race mixing is communism. Now, I'm not a communist scholar, but I know enough about race, about communism to know that race mixing is not communism. It's not inherent <laughs> right. to communism. It, there's nothing about communism that tells us that we have to mix the races. I mean, it, it, might, it might suggest that, but there's nothing ideologically or theoretically about uh, communism that tells us that that is the case. Well, well, well Joel, if, black, if white people believe that, then white slave owners would not have raped black women. And created a whole race of biracial folks when you was illegal to 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 engage in the transatlantic slave trade. So they started raping women, creating laws that say that the child's ethnicity is determined by the mother and not the father. So if they really believe that, then they created a nation of communists because of all the black women they were and the Native American women. Yeah, yeah it's it's wild. Like I I just can't take this That's seriously. Bullshit. So, wow. so really, no. For some people, this is it's not. They're not concerned about communism or Marxism. no not at all they're concerned that they there's latent even overt racism that's driving this now having said that for some people i think there is this type of hyper politicized concern about marxism and so on but i keep coming back to this question is systemic racism real or not is systemic racism real or not and if it's real if there really is systemic racism in the united states today then i want to know why people are so disproportionately concerned with critical race theory, with the influence of Marxism, when systemic racism is real. Like, let that sink in. If you think that systemic racism is real, then your disproportionate emphasis and fixation on critical race theory, on Marxism, is completely out of place. I'm not saying that you can't have any concern about that, but the way that predominantly white churches, white communities, white people have fixated on this and made this the focal point of their concern reveals that they're they're prioritizing something that they should not be prioritizing because systemic racism is real. Now, the reality is that a lot of people don't think systemic racism is real. Fair enough, but let's have that conversation. And so when people want to you know, want to center their concerns about Marxism, critical race theory, uh, totalitarianism, and so on. I, my, my tendency is to say, look, that's all very interesting, but I really want to know if systemic racism is real. Are you willing to look at some of the evidence for that? Because the reality is, (laughs) um, the reality is that what, you know, the evidence determines whether or not systemic racism is real. And not, and not your own feelings, the evidence. That's exactly right. Yeah, and I mean, like, there's look, there's there's this there's this fallacy in in logic called the red herring, and basically, it's when you introduce a consideration that is irrelevant to the to the, to the soundness of an argument. It's irrelevant to the plausibility or truth of a conclusion. So, you know, the the sort of idea behind the red herring analogy is that uh, the red herring is a really smelly type of fish, mm-hmm. and apparently, if you were being chased by the authorities, um, you're you know you're be- being pursued by like. Um, like hounds, you could take this fish and swipe your trail and it would completely divert the, the hounds who are tracking you. Well, this is, this is a, some, this is a phenomenon Dang, that happens. That'll preach Joel. That will, I got a sermon bro on that. Keep going. <laughs> yes. Amen. Snap. And so this is, this is a, this is a phenomenon that we're seeing when it comes to racial justice discourse. Um, you know, people will often say, well, Hey, did you know that like, you know, Marx, you know, some critical race theorists or some people who are pushing for for racial justice have been influenced by Marx. And look, again, that might be true, but the question is, does systemic racism exist? And you don't answer that question by looking at the etiology of people's belief in systemic racism. You don't answer the question, is systemic racism real by asking yourselves, well, do people who believe in systemic racism also believe in Marxism? Like that's just irrelevant to the logic and truth and plausibility of that, that question. And I want people to answer that question. I want people, I want white people to face that too. question seriously. And I think our fixation on the potential threat of Marxism or the influence of Marxism is not helping us think about the rationality of that conclusion. And so, yeah, I just encourage, I just encourage even just listeners, like if your friends and family, your, your skeptical friends and family, 
uh, raise this question about Marxism and CRT, I just say, bring them back to the question of systemic racism and, and take them on a journey, like roll up your sleeves, go on a journey with them of trying to figure out uh, whether there is systemic racism and sure. try to avoid the red herring of yes. you know, the influence of Marx on some of these movements. Analogy. You know, it, it, and actually intro the introduction of that, that criticism of, of CRT, uh, of, of trying to diffuse um, black movements for equality or just a movement for equality is really a brilliant one because it, it weaves together nationalism and and faith. I shouldn't say faith because I, I would say nationalism and what we're broadly seeing in white evangelicalism. So that if I can't scare the bejesus out of you by saying this is anti-biblical, I'm going to prove to you that it is anti-American. Exactly. And so if we can't discredit this person with scripture, we're going to say that they don't love America. And if you say that to, to folks who wave flags in their pulpits, and I'm not saying that people who do are racist, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying as a person growing up in black Christian circles, the first time I saw that it was just, it was so strange um, um, because our proof of patriotism was the fact that we served in every war and since we got here, including, you know, the revolutionary, you know, the, 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 the um, civil, you know, the civil war, we've, we've fought in every, every chance we got to prove that we are loyal to America and we still are fighting, you know, for, for rights. So I feel like that, that double-edged sword of trying to, to, to swipe at your sense of Christianity and your sense of nationalism by weaving those two together, which proves that faith and large segments of Christianity are largely patriotistic, uh, yeah. patriotic and nationalistic That's exactly in, right. in nature. And so th this is really, really interesting. Tyler, I see, I see you, I see you want to jump in. Yeah, well, the, the big piece about truth too, even just being able to embrace truth for what it is and, and being able to uh, look at something for what it is, even what Joel's saying about systemic racism plays such a huge part, a huge part. In, in my experience, there's a very different posture people take when they're bringing curiosity to the table and they're not sure about how racism is. They're learning, right? They're uncovering and they're, they're, they're being revealed something about history that they didn't know before. When curiosity is their posture, is such a different perspective than skepticism. When skepticism is the posture, it ends up with what Joel and I have talked about a lot, which is no matter how much evidence you, you give someone, they say, Joel and I, I've talked about this before, they said, well, that study is funded by a specific place. And so because that specific sure. place funded them, then I can't trust their research. And then it doesn't matter what you, what you bring, what evidence true. you bring to the table. You've discredited just, them. Exactly, they can discredit this stuff just because of who, sure. it, who it is. And, and so this evidence, of, of truth and being able to embrace truth is so important. Um, but it's interesting to think about uh, the, the realities of systemic racism and needing to, and, and having that being there because Joel actually shared something uh, recently uh, that I found really interesting. And, and, and it depends on your perspective too, which is that if your perspective is coming from a, a place of an African-American in our, in, our, um, in our history, you, you see, you've experienced for 400 years what that has done. And you're realizing that our current society is not one of freedom and democracy for all. Or it not at all. It's not, not at been all. rooted in that. Um, and everyone on our white perspective is sort of saying, sharing that maybe Marxist or totalitarian governments are the ones that we need to fear. We need to fear these and these and these. But Joel, what was it that you shared that, uh, could you just share that? Because I thought it was so good. Uh, yeah. Piece. Yeah, I mean... The basic idea is that in response to a lot of white Americans who are concerned about totalitarian-like qualities that might be arising in contemporary racial justice discourse, you know, like you hear about these stories where maybe like someone loses a job because they're not willing to like go through diversity and inclusion training or something like that. And like when white people hear this, a lot of white people, they get super concerned and they think, wow, sure. liber liberty is in jeopardy. But I think that this reveals that we have misremembered history we have misremembered U.S. history because we should never forget that for all the harms of totalitarian regimes in the, in, in the world, it was not totalitarian Marxism that led to the marred racist history that we've inherited as Americans, right? It wasn't, wow. it wasn't Marxism <laughs> right. that enslaved people. It wasn't Marxism that suppressed uh, voting rights. It wasn't Marxism that tried to intimidate and monitor MLK that jailed Rosa Parks that met the the Selma nonviolent protesters with billy clubs and horses and violence. It, it wasn't Marxist totalitarianism that 
did all these things. I mean, you name it. I mean, just think about every racial horror that America has experienced. Lynching. Was, Lynching. It, exactly. Yeah. It was not Marxism. It was people who were deeply anti-Marxist. And I'm not saying that there aren't things to be concerned about when it comes to Marxist totalitarianism. I'm just saying, if you're an American, you need to remember your history. And your history tells you that the deepest concerns in America are not the ones that a lot of white people are crying out about right now. It's the ones that racial justice activists are pointing out. It's racism. And so th that's where we need to, we need to, we need to align Man. our emphasis and align our concerns with reality. Right. And I think that a lot of people are concerned in a way that just doesn't correspond to the history and just, just doesn't correspond to the way things actually are. No, that's definitely true. And, and, and man, you just sparked a thought that I know we don't have time to unpack here, but you know, a few minutes ago, I, I said how I see a, a melding of, um, of, of white Christianity and, and, and nationalism and patriotism, but I also see a sense of sanctification of capitalism that somehow if Marxism is innately anti-God, then somehow capitalism is, is biblical, it's Christian in nature. And so, and most folks can even define Marxism. If you try to compare it to fascism and, but it's just, I'm it just sounds ominous as hell yeah. that when you just say Marx is like, Oh shit, I don't want that in my country. Yeah. Let's stop this protest. Cause it is an American thing to do. So I really like the way you all have helped to unpack this a bit because it shows that our arguments are getting stronger. When George Floyd died, we saw people in Syria, Turkey, other places around the world standing in solidarity. Yeah, we have moved a we've we've moved far. The needle is, the needle has moved far from when we had the Rodney King the trial of the uh, about Rodney King's beatings and how we just basically acquitted people and said no, they were just doing their jobs. To now the world is standing up saying, "What the hell, America? Freaking a, yeah, freaking America." A. And so now we're dealing we're dealing with national embarrassment the way we were during the cold war years when black leaders were pushing for equality so much that it made folks in the ussr um you know the soviet leaders as we call them back in the day were saying america how dare you try to become a world authority on fairness how dare you criticize communism look how you're treating people who have who are born in american soil whose roots go centuries back you are you you are no moral authority and so it's 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 again the attention that the, we're getting on the world stage is threatening and so the assassinations i've never said this before the assassination the assassinations have got to be um um ideological they've got to be philosophical the way that they're taking us out has got to be much much different and as a christian pastor I think you come at me by saying I hate America, that I'm somehow a latent or closeted Marxist. And you say things that make people say, oh, because I know the correspondence I get, the phone calls I get, the comments I get are people trying to prophetically correct me mm -hmm. because the assumption is I have somehow um, gone off on a deep end and I think they're trying to spare me from having the Holy Spirit write Ichabod on the side of Fountain of Life. Mm -hmm. That somehow the glory of God is lifted because I've become Marxist over the years. And is that idea, I'm not saying I am, I'm not, um, but is it is it any more strange to be Christian and, and, and Marxist than it is to be Christian and capitalist? I mean, yeah. Uh, listen, well, Oh, go, oh, go, go ahead. Well, I was, I was just going to say, John, I, I wonder what your experience has been, Dr. G, but I, I just found it interesting that when this outcry about CRT started to emerge after last summer, uh, a lot of black activists I was following were really surprised. Like I remember Elisa Sharon Harper and Rasul Berry were both like, I, I don't, I never heard of critical race theory until I never people did. started to tell me. Yeah. I heard you right. say this too. My degree and, is in African-American history and I've learned some of those principles, but I've never heard yeah. CRT. I just thought, Oh my God, what, what, what are they saying I'm doing? So I'm sorry to mean to cut. Yeah. No, I mean, exactly. So, so sometimes, so I, I'm in conversation with people who are saying, well, you know, critical race theory is so prevalent in academia and society that it's sort of smuggled itself in. It's like this Trojan horse. So even if you don't know it by name, it has influenced your thinking. And I, I've just heard like, I've heard uh, people of color say something like, well, hey, just so you know, 
my my grandmother, she didn't go to a four year college. She, you know, she she wasn't trained in your liberal arts universities, and she thinks systemic racism is real. She thinks white privilege is real. She thinks that all, you know, fill in the blank with things that some critical race theorists might endorse. Tell, try to convince me that she has been influenced by critical race theory. And it just feels like, it's, it, in some ways, it just feels so dehumanizing to say to the black community, well, this outcry is really generated by some kind of Marxist conspiracy. You're, I mean, it feels like it just- Right, yeah. you're co-opted by, by a liberal, progressive, Marxist um, agenda. And, and the, 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 the extra interesting um, part of this is, oh, so white people do believe in systemic realities. So that if this is really a product of the academy, then it is somewhat systemic yeah. in nature that in not even understanding that you're adhering to it, it is somehow seeped into your educational process. But systemic racism isn't. That's right. not, no, 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 that can't exist. That's not reality. But this theory somehow is somewhat systemic. Um, it's 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 crazy. I mean, I'm not trying to make this a theological episode, but listeners, you're getting a freebie here. The whole idea of our need to be absolved of sin is one of systemic nature, that we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity, that the concept of a savior in Christianity is that by no wrongdoing of our own, we have inherited a sin nature. So folks who ascribe to Christianity do on a very theological level understand systemic culpability. We understand it, the old Adam, the new Adam. But when it comes to race, we're like, ah, no, system, no, there's no such thing as, if there's systemic sin, wouldn't wouldn't it stand a reason that there are tributaries of that that might mm. that might play itself out in elitism and sexism and all other kinds of isms? And so I'm just thinking, I don't want to be dumb just because I, I ascribe to the Christian faith that I still want to use my brain. And so, how do you how do you march in North Carolina or Charlottesville singing blood and soil? You don't believe that racism has any bearing on today, but you think of 40 years of affirmative action does. So 40 or 50 years of affirmative action has ruined our country systemically, but raping and beating and cheating black people for 400 years has no bearing on today. Like that doesn't even make good sense. I, yeah. I, I can understand you wanting to hold on power, but work on some better outcomes because that just doesn't even stand to reason. Yeah. Listen, you guys, let me just ask you a couple of other closing things. This is, Joel, I need you to come back. I need you to consider being my resident um, philosopher. Um, and I mean, Joel, and Tyler will tell you, I'm serious when I say this. I'm going to do this with Tyler, too, because we, we're creating a segment called, you know, Working at White, where I want Tyler to kind of talk about where allies are doing things. But I think uh, I get the sense that my listeners, a lot of them are coming through the academy. And I think they need this kind of fodder, Joe. They need this in order to share it with friends. Like right now, even as people are listening, they're thinking, damn, I know some people I got to share this with. So let me just ask you something. When I've been doing trainings, I've been doing more and more of this with um, cross-cultural leadership training. I, you know, I'm doing some work with the Milwaukee Bucks. I'm doing some work with um, the nine judiciary committees here in the state of Wisconsin. And one of the, I'm with, with major corporations. And one of the things I'm sharing is racial reconciliation and harmony does not have to be a zero sum game, which means it's a loser and a winner that there can be winners and winners. It can. And so what are white men, what are white folks afraid of, lo of losing? So let's just say race, let's just say all of these things are true. We are uh, habitually systemically um, um, racial society. We're trying to get equality. We're not trying to put white people you know, in jail, we're not trying to put y'all on boats and send you back to, 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 to Britain or back to, to, to Europe. If we could just answer some of these just quickly, guys, I know that may be tough. Um, and then if one of you answers, I might ask the other one to, to answer the next question. But whoever wants to take this one, what are whites afraid of losing in this discourse right now, in this reality? Tyler, Joel is pointing at you. I'll, I'll just say one of the big things that I can think of off the bat is being seen as wrong or being seen as um, even morally culpable of that, their leadership right now. And again, I, I just think a lot in times of church context, like the idea that this could be true. And as a leader, pastor, I've missed it this long and led people away for so long mm -hmm. and having to own that culpability and that my study, my academics, my all of this missed this for so long it's too scary to think about um it it couldn't possibly be true because if it was true i would have a whole lot of repentance 
that would yeah. have to be going on here. Um, Joel, go ahead. Joel. Real quick, I, I just recommend the listeners to, to look up research by this sociologist, Brian Lowry, L-O-W-R-Y. Um, we'll put a link to that in this and actually in our notes, Joel. Yeah. Say his name again, please. Brian Lowry. He's right. doing really remarkable research on the way that white people respond to claims about systemic racism, about privilege, and uh, generating some really interesting insights about how defense mechanisms are turned on and how we can try to, you know, subdue some of those defense mechanisms, you know, because, you know, what some of his research shows that even just talking about white privilege, people immediately heighten and exaggerate the extent to which they've suffered and the extent to which they've had to labor to get where they are. And there's really interesting, cle like clever experiments he's conducted to show that we actually exaggerate as white people when we're told that we have white privilege. Um, so it might be there's, a, there's this kind of need to vindicate ourselves. Like when we hear what we hear that we might have white privilege, we're inclined to think that we're being told that we haven't worked hard at all. And so um, Brian Lowry mm -hmm. has some really remarkable research on this. But also, I mean, part, part of the issue is we need to depoliticize, I think, some of our concerns about racial justice. I think white people, especially um, a lot of, yeah, I'll just say that white people, I think, hyper politicize some of these issues and are looking for political Trojan horses everywhere. And I think that's part of the concern, Dr. G, is that a lot, there, a lot of white people think they're going to lose a conception of liberty and justice that, I don't know, is somehow at, at threat because of this racial, current racial justice movement. And I don't know the answer to like how to, how to diffuse that concern, but I think that's part that's of it. That's what it is. And for those who ascribe to Christianity, Joel, that should not be... Uh, that should not be a priority. So I understand why general Americans are, but I don't feel like I'm being accused of CRT by John Q public or just yeah. the average white person. I feel like it's coming out of my faith community and that's, we're called to give up power for the good of society and the good of others and not necessarily hoard it. And so I'm concerned about the spiritual depravity that is not just taking place because of this, but that this is growing out of a place of spiritual depravity, which means the very folks that have been denounced, the very, the very, um, the very folks that have, that have that have been deemed dirty and ragged and savage and all of these things, are the very ones um, whose feet society may need to sit in front of to understand how to navigate life. For example, for four hundred years my fathers and grandfathers have been deemed dangerous or potentially rapist because of our gender and ethnicity. And the darker we are, the more of a threat we are. Now white men bear that pressure of being so many kinds of things, um, um, chauvinistic and sexist and racist and homophobic and so many things they're being accused of. Uh, for the first time in US history, white men know what it's like to be a black man. Mm. Thing. And we can help white men be understand that, but it's going to mean humbling themselves. Yeah. That if you keep pushing us down, then you don't, there's very few people who can understand you, white men. White men, there's very few people who can understand you like a black man can, but you convinced yourself that I want your job, your money, your position, your woman, your house. And so you see me as competition or threat. And I know how to help you raise your sons because I was raised in reality that I would be thought of as a threat. I was given the talk 50 years ago. You're 57 years old, white man in America, and you haven't had the talk. So you haven't taught your sons or your grandsons. Whose fault is that going to be? What's the major difference between the world that both of you navigate today than the world that your white fathers, or Joel, in, in your case, I say your maternal grandfather, what's different about the world today that you're navigating that the white men in your families? had to navigate like i can speak to one difference that i know um i actually talked with my dad about this recently um because we talked about how uh he, he just went through the black history course actually he, he went sure. through it this time and um one of the things that he talked about a lot was um he talked about uh, even even highlighting the movie scene in 42 where jackie robinson goes up to the plate and uh, there's, uh, there's this white father and white son. And the white oh. son is kind of like cheering him on. And then he sees his white father call him the N-word. And so he starts, he sees his father do that and looks back and he starts jeering him and calling him the N-word too. 
Um, and my dad talked about the experience of himself having uh, maybe growing up in more of something like that, growing up in an experience where um, uh, he he's experiencing more of seeing some sort of explicit racism. And he's, he's talked about, I'm, I'm really, I'm just proud that you didn't grow up in a household that was explicitly racist like that. Right. You, you, you and he, he kind of was questioning. He was like, uh, you know, you, you never grew up with that. And it was interesting. I got to talk to him. Um, and because of the background of the history course, I think this was, was real. It was like, dad, it, I, I definitely, I did not grow up in a household that had explicit racism like that, but implicitly through our nation and through the history of what we've gone on. I even told him the story about the 10 year old, right? I said, those are things that have been a result of our, uh, of growing up or obviously you never explicitly spoke on anything, but within our family dynamics and within all of that, we, we, we live in an, in a society where the environment is full of toxicity of racism. And I've had to shed a lot of that as, as I've grown and, and as I've become aware and as people have gone and, and I'm like so incredibly proud of my father for going through the black history courses he's sure. done and sure. continuing to grow and all of that and say, um, yeah, I, I just think that it's interesting to watch how um, even what's going, I think when you, when you find yourself inside a community like that is black led, right? That is, mm -hmm. that is like JA and EMI and FOL there's a freedom found in here because uh, pastor you've talked about this before. You expect us to come with, with the, that, that we have some issues to work out. You don't right, expect right. any white person who walks into our space to be like, Oh, we've got it all figured out. And so when we have that commitment of love and bond there, there's an ability to be free and to have freedom in there um, versus uh, when you're, when you don't have that space and you're trying to figure it out on your own and you're all worried that I'm going to say the wrong thing, or I'm going to, of that when i say the wrong thing you let me know <laughs> and it's uh it's very it's very clear um and so th there's there's sort of a freedom about that having those sort of relationships. but it doesn't change the relationship mm, yeah that when that when that's happened it hasn't it hasn't changed the relationship you, you know guys um i don't think the academy is woke i don't think the church is woke but I, when i see leaders like yourselves influencers like yourselves asking the right questions it's not because you have all the right answers but you're asking the critical questions it makes me have a sense of, of hope. And, um, you know, I could imagine that when my ancestors were enslaved and they would steal away to have those midnight prayer gatherings because they were illegal. Uh, because the fear was that if slaves prayed to God, they might develop a sense of, of, um, of, of worthiness and maybe that God would hear them and make them think that they were equal to their slaves, to their slave owners. Um, but I, I have to believe that, that if they risked their lives to pray, they didn't just pray for freedom, but they prayed for freedom of those who were trapped by the system of slavery. I have just knowing black mothers and how they pray. And, uh, and they don't just pray just for those who are jailed, but jailers. They don't just pray for those who are being arrested by police officers because I know how they pray. I have to believe that the abolitionists were the, the product of praying white grandmothers and of praying black grandmothers that God would would do something powerful and so I, I just I just believe that um, I've got to continue to pray and work with um, young white women and men and of other ethnic backgrounds who can be a part of helping to pull the the covers back and helping to get rid of the scales that are on people's eyes because I believe that if we truly see what's going on um, we can we can we can make a difference and I think that that piece is really really important um, Joel, I think I'll add with just asking you a question, not putting you on the spot too much because you could, because you're a philosopher, that means you don't speak, you know, philosophers, I think, want to think about things a bit. But as you've explored issues of, of racism and what it might take to have true reconciliation or healing, um, has this journey influenced your scholarship and your life spiritually? Yes, yes, on every account. Um, it has definitely influenced my scholarship. Um, I mean, I, I, I started thinking about justice issues by first thinking about um, global poverty. And then somehow I started thinking more about gender justice issues. And it was interesting that like that journey really laid the foundation for me, I think, to better appreciate the claims and invitations I was hearing from the African-American community to go on that journey. 
And so I think that um, being brought into the journey of allyship, starting to take uh, people of color, starting to listen to their stories and take those seriously has definitely enriched my, my scholarship 100%. Um, I just sent out a paper to a conference, um, a paper where I explore the way that the um, image of God connects with the question of who has responsibility for injustice. And in this paper, I, I cite Jamar Tisby from the, um, oh, what's that podcast? Pass the mic. Pass the mic. Yeah, it's this really remarkable podcast. And I just like, I cite the podcast because Jamar Tisby is just doing wonderful activist right, work. Right. And so in this like, you know, this paper I sent to a, you know, a relatively reputable philosophical conference, I'm like citing black activists and he's a scholar too, but I'm citing his, his work as an activist. And um, so it has definitely, imp imp you know, improved, wow. enhanced my work. And espe especially I would say absolutely my spirituality has been enhanced. I mean, I think that one of the reasons I decided to attend FOL is because I knew that my discipleship needed to be deepened. I knew that my, my fidelity to the way of Jesus and to the, into the, the kingdom of God uh, was lacking in an important way. And I knew exactly where it was lacking. It was lacking in the area of understanding justice and especially understanding justice as taught by those who have been doing justice their whole lives for centuries namely the black community. And so I'll never forget last summer when I was not yet a member of FOL, but I was listening to your sermons and you, uh -huh. you just invited the listeners. You just call, you, you basically were calling out white America and saying, come on, like there's room at the table. We want you here, but we're calling you out. You need to come and you need to listen and you need to grow and it's going to be challenging, but we want you here and you better come. And I, re I remember just like getting goosebumps and just feeling like that invitation is for me. And I need to come under that leadership and under that discipleship and um, I'll never be the same. So it has seriously enriched my life. That's so powerful. Listen, gentlemen, I know we've gone way over, but this has been tremendously rich. And I hope that um, down the road, we, we can come back again and talk about some things. But um, Joel, I'm very serious about talking more about the philosophy behind injustice because I think it will help to open the eyes of people. So I would love to talk with you about that off, off the record. You all, I told you, I set this up, that we're going to have this scintillating conversation. So my guests um, have been uh, Tyler Nyland and Joel Oblivion. You know, we, you know, Tyler is a pastor and theologian. Joel is a PhD student in, in philosophy um, and they're best buds, even though they don't have a picture <laughs> together. But we'll talk about that um, off the air. Listen, folks. We don't create this podcast just so that we can fill our time of the air. We do it to really change mindsets because we believe that people with changed mindsets can then become a part of changing systemic realities and issues. So listen to this twice. Um, share it with friends who are wrestling with issues that can be addressed or answered in this episode. Um, and don't just um, share it with your friends share it in social media and, and, and put comments and thoughts in. That means a lot to me. Um, go to the, to, to the places where you download this and write a comment there. It helps us to, to have your comments. Subscribe to the podcast and click the, the Patreon link because we'd love to have your support in helping us to maintain this high level program. All right, so folks, listen, lean in, become a part of the change that you want to see in the world. And thank you so much for being a part of the Black Like Me listening family. And thank you again to my special guest. Have a great day, everyone. Black Like Me. Black, 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 black. This has been another exciting episode of Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G. Special shout out to Eli and to Jeremy who are my engineers and my editors on this, to Don Thornton, who is my podcast manager, who makes sure that we line all of this up, to Corey Saffold, who is responsible for that exciting new jingle, that Black Like Me uh, jingle. I'm so excited about that. And to um, Vocals by Marcus Fleming. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. You can find out more about Dr. Alex G's amazing work at alexg.com. Black Like Me is sponsored by the generosity of the Human Family Unity Foundation. Black
like me.